Thank you, Emily. Ooh, I'm allowed today. Not quite alive, but I am loud. But, uh, thank you to uh, the worship team and PA and stuff for sorting out the gremlins before we get to, uh, too far in the service. Last week was a bit different, but uh, thank you to what you contributed for us this morning and just helping us to think and focus on uh, what it means as we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper to lead us into that. Tonight, 7 o'clock, I'm going to bring the second of the uh, presentations that we've been doing out of uh, the sabbatical study that I did back in the autumn. Uh, Last two weeks, we've been looking at the challenges we face in sharing the gospel today and next week, because I'm going to repeat it, the opportunities that our society and culture present us. I'm going to look and see how Scripture helps us to unfold that, that we might be a bit more effective in sharing the gospel with the world around us. And in in the way that God works, this morning sort of fits into that quite well. Uh, Not planned, but much of what God does for us doesn't get planned by human reasoning, but the Spirit works and guides and leads us, so that's great. I've got no signal. Oh, that's a good start. Let me... um, I thought that was... Did I do two? Yes. There we go. Let's uh, start again. Ooh. Still no signal. Oh, there we go. There is a signal. A bit like me this morning. It's taking a little while to get going and wake up. Right. Good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for one another. Thank you most of all for Jesus. Thank you that as we focus on him, our unity grows and develops, and we become one body. So, Father, as we open up your word, as we explore this uh, last session on this topic, guide us by your spirit, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So we're looking today at uh, the Lord's Supper and commitment. Uh, And it's around a meal. And I was thinking about the number of things that I've eaten in my life and the different cultures that I've eaten within. So uh, in 1983, 84, uh, a meal for me amongst local people in Niger in Africa would perhaps be okra steamed and with a little bit of flavoring that looked like slimy stuff when you've got a really heavy cold around a bunch of steamed millet that was a bit like a blancmange that had been sat in the fridge for six months. And around the edge, as it was cooked and baked, would be hard little stuff. And I just remember one time when I was sitting in a little village hut, and being a white person and being a driver of a vehicle and having the village health team, I was the honoured guest, and so I get the first dippings. And next to me in this little hut was this man hacking and spitting with late-stage TB. And this globulate stuff, of which is actually quite tasteless, was being forced down my throat. It very nearly came up. All the time when we were in Singapore and uh, we took our little daughter, who was about two years of age, and some friends uh, who were visiting there, took us out to the hawker stands in Singapore for a treat, and there in the middle of the the table, with all this beautiful Chinese food around, was a bowl of chili. And what should Ruth do but I put her hands in the chili bowl straight into her eyes. And we were then surrounded by Chinese grandmothers who were there trying to help us as this child screamed. All the time when uh, in the Philippines, amongst Filipino people in a retreat, breakfast was served and it was chocolate rice together with dried fish. Meals are a challenge, aren't they? And different cultures operate and do things differently. But one thing that is common about all meals is that they draw people together. I've just spent the last 30 hours in Oxford at a retreat, and it was the meal times that cement relationships and provide opportunity for relaxed, which then lead into the business time. 
Meals are significant, but they were even more significant than perhaps we can imagine in Middle Eastern culture. In Middle Eastern culture, hospitality is absolutely intrinsic to the way that things operate. Because if you're in a desert or a poor area and the water is not is scarce, it's a matter of life and death whether you welcome people into the family, into the tribal home or not. And we know that Jesus grew up in a Middle Eastern culture. Our Bibles are written in a Middle Eastern culture right from the very start. And within that culture, to eat together wasn't simply a matter of relating with one another and having a bit of food. It was a trust commitment that went from the host to the guest and from the guest to the host. And to break that bond of relationship and to betray it was the worst of things you could possibly do. And it's not surprising that God brings for the people of Israel meals as part of the celebration feast that took place during the history of the Jewish people as they grew and developed. And the feast of the Passover was a significant one the key one in terms of understanding the cross because it was a celebration of freedom from captivity. It was a celebration of all that took place from bitterness and awfulness to freedom and rest. It was a celebration of the event which took them from Egypt and captivity to the promised land. And it's Jesus who is our Passover lamb. So in John 13, when John recounts what took place in that Passover feast, that one of the meals that takes place throughout the feast, which is a seven-day feast of unleavened bread followed by Passover, is that the very disciple who had been part of the band of, apostles, of disciples is seen to be the one who betrays him. And in John chapter 13 and verse 18, Jesus quotes from Psalm 41 these words, He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And we read that and we think, oh yeah, okay, we know what that's about. But we don't get the gut feeling of how awful this was. Jesus then proceeds to share this portion, what we call a sop, with Judas and says to him, go on, get on with it. And Judas leaves. Breaking fellowship meal was a breaking of a commitment that was more than just awful, despicable. In Obadiah verse 7, in one of the judgments that God gives against the Old, people of, Old Testament people of Israel, those who eat bread with you will set a trap for you then goes on to say, but you will not realize or recognize it. So blind are they to the realities of what is taking place. So as we explore and look at the Lord's Supper, we need to recognize and see what a significant event is taking place. And it is around this meal. And it's a commitment around a meal that calls for loyalty. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to ask people around about commitment today, you'd get lots of different answers. Could have brought a little sort of clip to show. But actually, generally speaking, we don't like to commit to things, do we? We like to keep our options open. We're great as a church like this. We put up a sign-up sheet, you know, and it's last minute. (laughs) Yeah? We have to have our clipboards out, don't we, to go round and say, Are you coming? Are you coming? 
to get signed up. Uh, we have things like rotors and washing up and stuff. And it's a lot easier to say, well, possibly, maybe, rather than, yeah, I will. Um, commitment is a struggle, not just for us as a church community, but it's a struggle outside. We like to keep our options open so that there might just be a better deal around. Uh, and being very clever and crafty, people who run businesses recognize that. So have you noticed over the last five, ten years, mobile phone contracts, they've gone from 12 months to 24 months. Why is that? Well, because they have you hooked in and they are committed. You are committed. They can guarantee the income. And when we get used to that and we think, okay, we'll wait for two months, uh, for two years to come up and then we'll swap, get a better deal. They ah, oh, what we'll do is at 18 months, we'll offer a free upgrade. A free upgrade, not for six months at the end of the first contract, but another two-year contract. So they've got you for four and a half years. Very crafty, aren't they? Two can play that game. I've still got mine and reduced it. I've got a new phone, but I don't pay very much money. And I can leave when I want. But anyway, that's another matter. About marriage. Keep our options open because you never know, I might fall out of love. That wonderful person that was there, well, there might just be somebody else. So that bit of paper, that commitment to a lifelong experience of being with this one person till I am old and wrinkly and pass the old and wrinkly to the fragile and feeble, that I'll still be there? Whoa, no. Let's keep our options open. What about mortgages? I was 22 when I had my first mortgage. Now, I know the world was different then. But it was something of value to me. I wanted to be hooked into the housing market. I was very happy to spend however much it was of my salary, which was quite a lot, to be committed to something that will eventually, in the end, realize some investment. Now, I know today's world, it's really hard to get together sufficient to be able to make a mortgage. But I don't see our youngsters generally saving. I do see our youngsters spending gap years a year out, and that's great. It's great to have the experiences. But let's wait until we're older, and then perhaps we'll think about commitment and settling down. We have a commitment-phobic society. And actually, the faith and trust that Jesus calls us to is a commitment for life. So we've got to recognize and see that we've got a challenge on here. This is one of the gospel challenges that we face And we've got to get beyond that. What about commitment to Jesus? Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's possible to have him as Savior, but to keep him at arm's length in terms of this word, Lord. It's going to be our Lord and Savior, or our Savior and Lord. It's going to be actually everything he does and says, we follow. Now we know as a body of people, as a community, the church is always going to be a mixed group of people. And it should be. It is really unhealthy if everybody who is here in the congregation today is a Christian. We want and we welcome and we have an open door. We want to invite people to see and to find out who Jesus is. There is a belonging to the people of God in the sense of coming along and being part of a congregation before often there is a believing in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And there's a process in which that takes place. 
And the more unchristian our society is, the greater that journey is going to take, the longer that journey is going to take. And for many of us who have been Christians for a long time, it's possible, isn't it? To know that we're saved, but actually in terms of, Lord, no, I struggle with that one a bit. But I know that God's going to be loving and gracious and forgiving, and does it really matter? Yes, it does. I was going to share tonight, there is nothing more important for the world and our culture, our Western culture, to see the reality of living faith being worked out in holy living, of the distinctiveness of people of God living with Jesus as Lord and, and Savior. So when it comes to sharing the bread and the wine and the juice together, there's an element in which we are welcoming and bringing everyone who wants to explore and find Jesus. So in the community of God's people, there will be those that belong as well as those that believe. But the desire of those of us who believe is that those who belong become believers. But they won't take that journey unless they are there to explore. So we looked at that passage in John 13 about Judas. And I know one or two of the groups have sort of explored, was Judas there at the Last Supper? Well, it's very difficult to be categorical in statements and say he was or he wasn't. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in which we see the institution of the Lord's Supper by Jesus with the words, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me, this is my blood, the new covenant are present. There is no mention in those chapters, in those uh, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, whether Judas was present or he wasn't present. In John, we read that he left. But there is no institution of the Lord's Supper in the chapter in John 13. And some have said, well, if Judas was present, actually it's open to anybody. And it's very difficult for us to argue out of silence in Scripture. But we can use Scripture to help us understand Scripture. And as the early church grew and developed, the key passage that we have in 1 Corinthians creates an environment where there was obviously a mixed group of people around. There was lots of stuff that wasn't going very well, but there was a mixed group. So we want people to find Jesus. We want to find him in the whole of life. And it has been possible, I believe, and it's one of the things we've been looking at as an eldership over the last two or three years, and we shared with the church last year, to come and to share the bread and the juice together and to give thanks for forgiveness of my sin, but without actually recognizing what it means to be his, our Lord. So opening up the way in which we celebrate the Lord's Supper together to begin to explore those different areas in which his Lordship begins to happen is a whole life change. Yes, when we become Christians, we are justified. We are as if I had never sinned. But that process of growing in holiness, which we call sanctification, is a whole life-long journey. And it is a whole life-embracing experience. So you can say to the Lord, yeah, I'm really sorry about my anger. But you can carry on being angry. And you can hide that from the body of the church, can't you? We're great at giving this wonderful face that looks all wonderful on Sunday morning. Um, But then when we get home, we lay into our wife or our children. But to have opportunity to explore and to invite people into hearing, actually there is a growing change that can take place as we recognize, one, we are forgiven, but two, we can be transformed and changed. So we have a meal to remember him. Remembering him who died for us. 
So thank you for those songs this morning. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, it's old, but it's true. Can wash away my sin. He loves us with an everlasting love. (coughs) Absolutely. So as we meet together, as the community of God's people, there will be those who believe and those who belong. But here's an opportunity for us as we eat and drink the elements of bread and juice and wine, to commit and recommit our loyalty to him. And that might be at various stages along the line. Growing in our understanding of who Jesus is. But it's also an opportunity and provide an opportunity for us to commit and recommit ourselves to the family of God, the people that he has drawn together to be a local expression of his love and his goodness so that we grow in our sense of community, that we don't put on these great faces that said, us is all sorted, but that we struggle and we work with one another in community to grow. So that commitment to Jesus that is expressed in this meal together is a commitment, too, to allowing him to impact the whole of my life. I know some of you are going through some real struggles at the moment, trying to work out how and what's the right thing and the best thing to do. And it's wonderful to be able to bring ourselves together and to say, pray for me, share with me. Allow God's Spirit to come and to work in me. So there's a meal a meal which brings with it a loyalty and a commitment. And that commitment is remembered around the elements of Jesus' death and his body broken and his blood shed. And it is an exclusive relationship. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 14 to 22. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. There are all sorts of stuff going on there which isn't particularly helpful. And he's having to help them to see the reality of what it means for Jesus to be both Savior and Lord. Verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean that a sacrifice offered to an altar is is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? We only eat at Jesus' table. That's what we want people to understand and to recognize. That there is a a reality that we are remembering and we are sharing together that creates a distinction between how the world works and how the Christian family works. Now I appreciate that at times our language and our words can get a bit confusing. So when we talk about the, the wider church, in my thinking that's all the people that come along into like a Sunday or a Thursday. These are contacts that we've got. In a sense, that's probably not a good word because you can't be the wider body of the church because you're either in relationship with Jesus or you're not. So maybe a better way that I should be using is the wider community. And we want that to be a wide community. We want people to be finding, and our whole strapline as a church is to point people to Jesus. But as we do that, we have to be sharing with people, actually, you can't have Jesus and. 
It's an exclusive relationship. He calls us to a commitment of which he is both Savior and Lord. (coughs) So the people of God, the body of believers, are a saved people. And unless you have come to that place of faith and repentance, trusting in Jesus as your Savior, you cannot be part of the body of Christ. You are not yet a Christian. As Paul writes in the letter to Ephesians that we looked at, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. But God in his great mercy has made us alive in Christ. Not by works, but by grace. So we are a saved people. And we want to point people to Jesus. So we need to have those who are not yet saved around and to be connected with them to be able to point them to him. Otherwise it just doesn't make sense, does it? So when Jesus takes the Passover cup and that new covenant is signed with his blood as we looked at last week, actually that is what we are pointing people to. Exclusive relationship. Turn over with me one chapter into 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. So we've got a a meal which has a loyalty with it. We have an exclusive relationship. We are looking for that sense of both Savior and Lord. And in chapter 11, verse 27, Paul says to the Corinthians, having given them instructions as to how the Lord's Supper should be shared, how that love feast should operate in line with the gospel of inclusivity. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Wake up, please, if any are. No? Okay, good. But if we judged ourselves, we'd not have come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. We examine ourselves. This is not a navel-gazing introspection, but an examination of ourselves Am I committed to this community? Am I exercising that connection which the gospel has brought about that we are part of a family, that we are connected, that we have a responsibility for one another? Am I willing to share so that those who are coming to faith might understand what it looks like for Jesus to be both Savior and Lord? Am I remembering that Jesus died in our place? Is this just something that we're doing because it's the third Sunday in the month or the fourth Sunday in the month? Is there a sense in which this is becoming real? Am I celebrating the new life that we've received? So that new life that we've received is a holistic experience of wholeness and peace in those areas of life where we know we are broken? So am I growing in that sense of allowing the Lord to transform and to help me? And what better testimony to be able to share around the table than actually, yeah, I really struggle with lust. I really struggle with anger. But, you know, bit by bit, I was a terrible swearer. Couldn't say, open my mouth without words coming out. But by God's grace, I've been able to bring about a change and a transformation. These are real and earthy and great opportunities for people to see who look at us of the life-transforming work of the Spirit of God. Do I commit myself to live for Jesus? So tomorrow morning, what does this look like? And so we have opportunity on a regular basis as we're trying to bring in this coming month to be able to look and explore those different aspects and to be able to see how that's worked through 
as part of the body of Christ. So the question is, what, what are those elements of bread and wine? Well, they're symbols. It's just a piece of bread. It's just a bit of juice. But is it just a bit of bread? And is it just a bit of juice? Well, it may be. It may be that actually in declaring and seeing, without that faith and trust, it's a recognition that, yes, Jesus is special, but not necessarily Lord and Savior. But for those who bring and themselves under examination, those elements combined with faith, combined with loyalty, combined with a desire to allow the Spirit of God to work in us, can be transformed so that it becomes a spiritual transformation that takes place within us. So yes, they are symbols, but they are symbols that have a power to remind us and to recall us and to bring us back to the realities of what Jesus has done for us. And we've gone through quite quickly what we looked at about nine months ago. And we've used a different format, one that was being produced by CWR called Eat, Pray, Share, and there's still copies at the back of this. Please do take one, as it explores that a little bit more. But it fits so well with what, as a church and as an eldership, we were exploring and looking at. And because we were struggling to come to terms with how do we open up this wonderful celebratory meal that God has given to make it living and real rather than just an event that took place on the third Sunday in the month. So as we explored that, this is where we came to. I'm just going to spend the last five minutes exploring this to help us understand what we as a church agreed and are moving to. So the Lord's Supper is primarily about what Jesus has done. It's not about us as individuals. So that declaration of what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross is a key part of what we want to share as we share the Lord's Supper together. I think next week we're, is it, we're looking at peace? I can't, yeah, I think it's peace. Sorry, my mind's gone a bit blank. Yeah. How many people in our world really know that sense of deep peace? and wholeness in life. Yet Jesus has won for us peace on the cross. Peace with God, but peace also with fellow men. We have a world which is ragged, don't we, with people who struggle with panic attacks, with depression, who do not feel at peace. Well, actually, Jesus has won for us peace at the cross. So we're going to be exploring that. And perhaps we'll have opportunity to share with one another uh, how we experience that. But it's a declaration of what Jesus has done for us on the cross more than it is about me and my personal relationship with him. That is a part of it. We're not saying it's not. But it's a declaration of what Jesus has done. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, point two, we want it to reflect, and this is what we brought back uh, to the church last summer, a meal. Because it's around tables, around community, that that interaction was taking place. So rather than sitting in our individual seats with our individual piece of bread and juice, actually we want to gathering the church together to be able to explore and to share. So it's also a remembrance so a part of this is to remember what Jesus has won for us on the cross. It's a participation. It's something we join in with. So we have opportunity to share and to look at the Bible together, to share experiences together. But it's a participation too with the bread and the juice as a body together, as a community. Now we change that in a sense by using this guide here with the five C's. 
the five C's being the Lord's Supper is a, celebrated as a community. So how can we provide opportunity for that community to take place? Do it around a meal. It's a remembrance or commemoration of what has taken place for us. It's a remembrance that we have a covenant relationship. So Jesus loves us. God loves us and he's given us a savior. And whatever we are, wherever we do, we have forgiveness because it's been won for us on the cross. But a covenant calls us to a degree of responsibility as well. We are not our own. We are bought at a price. He is our Lord. I'm going to live as he intended us to. It's a celebration. It's a celebration that there's a newness of life for those who come to faith and trust in Jesus. New life, new way of living. I can find peace. I can allow the Spirit of God to transform this terrible problem I got with anger to take it away and to bring me to a place of wholeness. This whole area of lust that can be worked through and I can come to a place of purity. Not because I'm doing it, but because the Spirit of God has won for me victory at the cross and the Spirit of God can transform and change me. And it's a commitment. A commitment to the body of Christ, to one another, to growing, to be the people of God who are radically different from the society in which we live, which ties in with what we're going to be looking at tonight, and a commitment to being a child of God, saved by the blood of Jesus because of the cross. So as we explored and as we looked at that, as we looked at scriptures, I feel that the Lord's Supper is an inclusive meal to which all are welcome, irrespective of clear salvation or age. I appreciate that for some that's a big change. There are some who've grown up within perhaps brethren circles where there's been a closed table where as I remember because I grew up in a brethren church you went to a different brethren church with a letter of commendation which you passed to the elders to see whether you could be part of the community that shares bread and wine together many of that has now changed but we have an open table and have always had an open table which anyone is free to partake of the, ju- of the bread and the juice. But at each time, we've been sharing and saying to people, look, this is for those who really love Jesus. But you know, people who belong before they believe find it very difficult to understand that distinction. So we want to try and include people, but to help them to understand. So there's a clear emphasis in that last point that taking part doesn't make us a Christian. Faith and trust in Jesus comes by personal faith and repentance. But it can be an important step along the way. So last year, alongside that, we had different opportunities to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We provided four opportunities for us as a church, whole family, We provided four opportunities for us to celebrate within our small group structure and four opportunities to celebrate as part of our prayer and meeting together during the week. We still had the 12 times. But I know that in response to people saying, I'd love to be doing that more often together, that from next week, every month throughout this year, at the end of the month, we're going to have a meal together. Not a full meal but there will be a food element. We'll gather around together to see and work through, continuing to work out how we incorporate each of these different aspects of the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. Many of us come from different church traditions. Some perhaps grew up in the Catholic church tradition. And they celebrate the Mass focusing on the death of Jesus, 
So within a Catholic church, you will see many a crucifix, a dead saviour on the cross. And there was a form that took place within that. There would be confession, probably the night before. And there would be, um, what is it that they give? Mine's gone blank. Uh, things that you have to do to uh, repent. Hail Mary. Uh, and then often you would not eat until you came to the Mass. And during the Mass, you would only be served the bread. The wine or the juice was reserved for the priest. Because within that section of the church, as we feel wrongly, it was the priest who was the one who could forgive sin. So he was the only one who took the, the wine. And when it came to the bread, that's only for the people. That and the whole doctrine that the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ, what was the theology of transubstantiation, don't worry about the long word, was something that the reformers and the reformation that we've been celebrating challenged, and rightly so. And so we ended up with the Church of England. And the Church of England focused pretty much on the celebration aspect of communion, Lord's Supper. They call it the Eucharist, which is a Latin word for thanksgiving. And that is the focus. And the bread and the wine are served, and they're served to those who have been confirmed in their faith. Within the free church, with all its various different denominations, a lot of that was moved away, and it was the remembrance of the death and resurrection of Jesus that became the co-focal point. Now, I bring those out because each church tradition has tended to focus on one aspect of what the Lord's Supper is. And I think it's right that we explore and see actually it is a whole. It is something much bigger that what we have been given by Jesus is a wonderful opportunity to grow together in him and in one another. Exploring and how that works through? Tough. So there's a commitment called from us as a church. Both us as a leadership, as we work through how do we lead these services? A lot more complicated. A lot more time and effort and energy. It's a bit like uh, service leading. You know, if I did it when I first started ministry, it's quite simple. You chose four hymns. Church secretary would get up, you know exactly what went on, you went home. Now it's far more complicated. So it is with the Lord's Supper. A lot easier just to have at the end of the service, 10, 15 minutes, when we go through a, almost by rote. Here we're looking to try and explore. So that each of these five aspects, the community, the commemoration, the covenant, the celebration, and the commitment, are worked out together. Why do we feel that's important? Because our world desperately needs to see the reality of living faith bringing about a change, transforming, and radically different community of God's people. To be a witness to the world outside which has gone crazy. That needs to see the reality of living faith worked out in wholeness, and in healing, and in commitment to one another and to God. And that, I think, is one of the greatest challenges that we've got. In living as Jesus, Savior, and Lord. As we do that, people get drawn in. And within that drawing in, we want them to see the reality that this is how it works pointing people to Jesus, using, among many different things that we have, this wonderful gift that's been given of a Thanksgiving meal. There's plenty there to talk about, discuss, think about during, our Lord's Supper, uh, during the week ahead with our small groups, and we have a members meeting in uh, eight days' time as well.
Put that in your diary, please. Do come along. That's an important meeting to be there. Sorry, it's slightly longer. Let me pray. And then we'll come to a close. Father God, we thank you for your great love for us. Thank you too for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you for this wonderful gift of a meal. A meal to remember you, a meal to connect with one another. As we explore and continue with this, Lord, guide and lead us, protect us, we pray, that we might become a body transformed by the power of your Spirit to be living lives that reflect your holiness, your love, and your goodness. For Jesus' sake, amen.